Hello everyone. We have some very interesting topics to discuss. So let's get right to it. How is psychology tied to the occult? Who is Psyche? And how is she the foundation of psychology? How is Psyche tied to the Nephilim? What's Pan's role in psychology? And how did Pan become a hero for our children today? I wanted to be Peter Pan when I was a kid. And finally, I'll talk about three demons that I removed in Boston and how I did it. This is part 2A in our series, How Demons Affect Human Behavior. This is an alternative to modern day psychology for Christians. And why exactly do we need an alternative to psychology? In an infinite universe, what makes man think his limited five senses or primitive science even scratch the surface of potential reality? Is it impossible to believe that beings or worlds or dimensions exist that we cannot detect with our limited five senses? However, psychology teaches that there is no invisible world or universe, that it doesn't exist, and only a crazy person would believe otherwise. Mankind has been living in a delusion on this fallen planet, dominated by a spiritual being Jesus called the Prince of the Air. Jesus spent a third of his ministry casting these parasites out of people. In Christ's own words, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you've received, freely give. Matthew 10, 8. This is entitled, Psychology's Occult Roots, and how it affected Christianity, and crippled Christianity. Let's take a quick overview of what we're going to cover. First of all, the failure of psychology, Psyche and Pan, the worship of feelings, Nephilim offspring, Enoch was real. Jesus and the Rock of the Gods preaching at Pan's Gate, Pan Today, Peter Pan, and Three Demons in Boston that I have managed to pull out of somebody, Angela Merkel and the Swiss Gates of Hell, Carl Jung and the Occult, the I Ching, which is divination. But first off, why did Jesus teach his disciples to remove demons or foul spirits before baptism or salvation? And why isn't this done today? Do you know of a church that does this? Psychology's role in altering, reshaping, and crippling Christianity. Let's take a close look at the occult roots of psychology. Here, for example, is a drawing by Carl Jung. A serpent impregnating a woman. You're going to see the serpent and dragon theme throughout psychology. Manipulating the minds of other people to get them to do your will is a type of witchcraft. Where does psychology come from and what are its roots? You have to look east and you have to look far east. You have to look at the serpent, and you have to look at the dragon, and you have to look at pain. Early psychology dealt with experiments like manipulating facial expressions, 
was manipulating human beings. Next they introduced hypnosis, mind control, Psychology introduced the notion of tribal rule over parental control. It's the birth of socialism. Psychology unleashed and sold the notion of that God's biblical definition of man and women were wrong. They introduced the transgender movement with zero scientific backup. Here's a secret. Lucifer is a legal genius, and he was there at the beginning. But what's important, and something you probably did not realize, is that Jesus is also a legal genius, and he is the beginning. And forgive us our trespasses, as we have forgiven the trespasses against us. That is a specific legal requirement. It's a contract you're making with God. And that's very important in what we're going to discuss. Alright, let's move on to a time when I actually pulled three demons out of a girl. I call her Cassandra. She wasn't really a girl, she was more of a woman. I think she was 29 when I met her in New Jersey. Psychologists said that she had a multiple personality disorder. Psy-D, multiple personality disorder or demon possession. Here's what happened. Cassandra was picked up by the slave traders overseas while she was in Europe. Very beautiful girl. She had actually been a model. This is her horror story. She had been kidnapped. I was her caregiver for about nine years. Her family actually abandoned her. She suffered from extreme trauma. She was picked up by armed men while she was in college at Duke University and taken in Greece. She'd been on an archaeological dig during the summer session. Back in the United States, Cassandra lost her ability to drive and suffered panic attacks which would sometimes last for several days. I would drive her to psychiatric appointments and was often called on in sessions to participate and verify facts about her history and about her case. Ten psychiatrists in nine years and all of them gave her completely different diagnoses about her condition. Several psychiatrists knowing the severity of her panic condition also diagnosed her as having ADHD and would prescribe Adderall which contains five types of speed. I can tell you speed and panic conditions don't mix well. Cassandra became addicted to the Adderall which made the panic attack so severe she would have to be hospitalized every time she would take it. I began to notice a pattern. The hospitals would pull her off Adderall and she would recover immediately within the same day. However, they would hold her for several weeks until her insurance was completely exhausted. It became a money-making game and the patient a cash cow. This cycle lasted nine long years, and the patient got worse and worse. After one visit to a psychiatrist, Cassandra told me he had given her a back massage in his office to help relax her. He was a stodgy neurological expert from Germany, and he died of a heart condition soon after. One psychiatrist prescribed methamphetamine after talking to her for about 15 minutes. She left with a prescription and the speed sent her to the hospital within six hours. The doctors had her hooked. She was an addict and it was very good for their business.
those psychiatrists had in effect become professional drug dealers. They have created a generation of pliant addicts with no capacity for thought or self-respect. Let's move on in our story. Cassandra's father, who was a former CFO at a major pharmaceutical company, believed his daughter suffered from multiple personality disorder and he offered to send her to a Psy D specialist in New Jersey. I took her and after nine visits and much testing, the psychiatrist told me to attend a session. Afterwards, she pulled me aside and said the following. Are you at all religious? She said. Yes, I responded. Well, she said, if you tell anyone I said this, I will deny it. Cassandra does not have multiple personality disorder. I believe there's something else inside of Cassandra that's causing her to act the way she does. She has a demon. She's demon possessed. Please be very, very careful. Well, this woke me up. At that point, I didn't really believe in demons. So next I'm going to tell you how I saw three demons and actually cast them out of Cassandra by the blood of Jesus Christ. About a year later, she had a seven hour panic attack in my condominium in New Jersey. She began to pull her hair out and I debated calling 911 but did not want her back in the hospital. Mercifully, she passed out after having been awake for almost 36 hours. She lay on the floor and I decided how to get her into a chair. When all of a sudden, before I could act, she woke up and sat up and started smiling at me. She actually looked radiant. You look so much better, I commented, as she sat on the ottoman in front of me. But suddenly her smile turned into a sneer, and then she began to speak. So you think you're one of the elect, she said. Well, you're not, in a nasty tone. And then she began to recite Bible passages to me for about 10 minutes. And I was so astounded and astonished that I remained quiet. Then she raised herself up proudly and climbed the stairs to the bedroom where she fell asleep for three days without getting up even to go to the bathroom. She had absolutely no recollection of what happened to her downstairs when she passed out. And Cassandra had never read the Bible. She moved to Boston and two years later I went to visit. She continued to have panic issues and what I would call electromagnetic problems where lights would often blink on and off around her and even alarms would sound. Here's how I threw out three demons and it worked. We went to the movies one Saturday night and it had recliner seats. I came prepared, I prayed and I fasted and brought a four page power prayer designed for the deliverance of Freemasons because her grandfather who was deceased had been a 33 degree Freemason and I thought she was suffering from a curse associated with that cult. In the middle of the movie, I prayed for spiritual fire as hot as the sun to descend upon Cassandra. I prayed under my breath very softly that God, Yahweh, would begin to change her heart and cook the parasites that were plaguing her. I asked this in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. As soon as I said that name, she jerked in her chair. She stopped watching the movie altogether and began to squirm in her seat. God, it's getting warm in here, she whispered to me. It's really uncomfortable in here. I think I'm getting a fever. I knew God was hearing my prayer and I knew the parasites were feeling it as well. I continued to pray very softly. I believe most demons cannot hear or read a human mind, but I do believe they can hear sounds that only a cat or a bat can hear. I prayed that this fire would continue as a warning of what was about to come. That I would be casting them out soon and they should leave peacefully now. 
And I pray that the light in heaven would begin to fill Cassandra in Jesus' name, rather than the light of Lucifer. And as I said those words, the light suddenly came on in the theater in the middle of the movie. This lasted 10 minutes until people around me became very frustrated and began to shout. Later that evening, we prayed together all four pages of the deliverance prayer. Cassandra balked on one paragraph dealing with the spirit of nicotine and fornication. Otherwise, she agreed to change her life and allow Jesus to make his changes. We removed all the curses on her life and contractual obligations passed down from earlier generations and dealings with the occult. Cassandra fell into a deep sleep, and I too dozed off. In the early hours of the morning, I prayed and silenced my internal dialogue and focused on the Holy Spirit. And suddenly I saw and felt an extremely old face. It was like a cartoon face. It was gnarled and had much character, and I could feel it from inside my stomach. It had no horns and looked almost human, but exaggerated, cartoon-like, and it was dozing. The Holy Spirit was allowing me to see a demon that was dozing around Cassandra. Then I saw a second, and then a third face. They were practically introducing themselves to me, all very different, as humans are very different. The Holy Spirit led me to pray to have them removed from Cassandra one by one. A demon of drug addiction, a demon of rebelliousness, and a demon of rejection. As soon as I said the name Jesus, Cassandra stirred in her sleep and began to try to clear her throat. All three were expelled one at a time with an exhale that caused her head and neck to arch backward. And it was done. They were gone. I took Cassandra to a local church in the morning, and she took communion. She still lives outside of Boston, but always has an excuse when Sunday morning rolls around. Demons returned, and they still plague her, but not like before. Her panic is gone, and she is able to go out a lot more. I believe the curse is gone, and her related suffering has abated. The seed was planted. Only God knows if it will grow and become fruitful. It seems to me that we and our advanced Western civilization have been like swimmers without snorkels. Our humanistic anti-spiritual view of the universe has kept us from recognizing the reality of a demonic realm that has never been far from us. Derek Prince What barriers or strongholds change the way Christians approach salvation? And why do Christians grow uncomfortable when approaching or even discussing demons or the spiritual kingdom Jesus refers to? Why are we locked into a limited way of thinking that denies much of Christ's ministry? Mankind's primitive science includes two weak links. The first one is evolution theory. And the second is psychology, or the study of feelings. To get a handle on the impossible evolution theory and its effects on our school system from socialist Nazi Germany to our present day United States, watch the Kent Hovind seminars. I highly recommend Kent Hovind. He says, teaching with the pagan religion of evolution is a waste of valuable class time and textbook space. It's also one of the reasons American kids don't test as well as kids from other parts of the world. I had a chance to meet Kent Hovind about a year ago, and it was mind-blowing. You can catch all of his videos, he has a series of six, I believe, on YouTube, and they're all free. Get to know Kent Hovind, because he blasts evolution to pieces. Alright, psychology, the study of behavior and mind, embracing all aspects of conscious and unconscious experience, with a few drugs thrown in to boot. Psychology, ology means knowledge about, psyche, the goddess of soul and feelings. Let's find out how psyche is related to psychology. 
Why Psyche? Who on heaven or earth is Psyche? She's got lots of statues around. She's got lots of paintings around. Here's a painting of Psyche. Very interesting. What does this mean? Why is the spiritual removed from psychology? Has psychology made the world a better place? This is Germany, 2017. Or is psychology merely a band-aid or medication on the ever-growing problems plaguing mankind? Can man fix man without the presence of God? How did Jesus fix people in distress, and why is he not our role model today? Why are we depending on psychology? This video was a biblical alternative to the dictates of modern psychology, or the study of human behavior taught through the worship of goddess Psyche, the goddess of soul and feelings. If the spiritual becomes banned in treatment, what happens if the problem was spiritual? Psyche is in fact an attractive human woman. A winged demigod or a fallen angel fell in love with Psyche and granted her godlike powers of influence. She in fact became like a god. The Bible mentions this event and cites this as one of the factors which brought about the flood of Noah. The book of Enoch, removed from the Bible 350 years after Jesus, details this event. Remember, Enoch was in the Bible for 350 years. We'll find out why it was removed. Psyche, the foundation of psychology. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown, Genesis 6-4. And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come. Let us choose wives from among the children of men and bear us children. These are the Nephilim, the giants of old. And when was the book of Enoch removed from the Bible and why? Everyone misses this one. In 390 AD, the church of Laodicea, condemned by Jesus in Revelation, held a council to have the book of Revelation and also Enoch removed from the Bible. A compromise was reached and Enoch was removed. Never compromise. But it doesn't end there. In the 1700s, a missionary group found the book of Enoch again in Ethiopia. The Ethiopian Christians not affiliated with Rome maintained the original books of the Bible. But guess what? For some reason, no one cared, and it was forgotten yet again. Somebody is hiding the Book of Enoch. In the late 1940s, it resurfaced again with other books of the Bible like Isaiah. They were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Everyone revered and believed Isaiah. No one wanted to touch Enoch. Here, Psyche and Pan are together. Hmm. The statue of Pan was at the gates of hell in Caesarea Philippi where Jesus stopped and taught. That was the center of Pan worship. Why is that important? Caesarea Philippi sits at the foot of Mount Hermon and butts up against a large cliff referred to as the Rock of the Gods where Jesus spoke to Peter and called Peter the Rock. Mount Hermon is also the place where the fallen angels in the Book of Enoch made a vow to disobey God and violate humankind by taking human women. Let's digress just for a second. Who is Azazel? 
The Israelites sacrificed the god Yahweh and were required to release a second goat to someone called Azazel. He's only found in the book of Enoch. So Enoch explains another portion of the Bible. Aaron had to cast lots over two goats, one lot for the Lord and one for Azazel. Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering, but the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it and released to Azazel. That's in Leviticus. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is Azazel. It's Pan. How do we view Pan today? You're going to love this one. It's hidden. Peter Pan. We teach our children about Peter Pan, the hero. And Hollywood portrays some evil Christian nuns who torture children and drive poor Peter to escape to the magic of sorcery to fly to Neverland to become an eternal being. To become Pan. But poor Pan is lonely. Eternal life is a long time and needs something to fulfill his life. He needs a female, a companion. And so with the help of a demon, Peter entices a human girl to follow him. He seduces her. He offers her eternal life and romance with a demigod. Does this sound at all familiar? Isn't this the story of the Nephilim? Pan entices Wendy to encourage others to follow them as well. Humans who become lost boys for eternity. Keep in mind we delight in selling this story to our children where Pan is the hero. It's a love story between the divine and a human. An imperfect eternal being and a human girl. It's the same love story as told in Genesis and in Enoch. The book of Enoch connects Azazel with the biblical story of the fallen angels at the 33rd parallel located in Mount Hermon. This is where the angels agreed to disobey Yahweh and mingle their seed with human women, teaching mankind secret knowledge that would bring the great flood of Noah. Here's a map, and there's Mount Hermon, and there's Caesarea Philippi, right at the base. The whole earth has been corrupted through the words that were taught by Azazel, to him ascribe all sin. Book of Enoch 10.8 The Sin Offering Why is this important today? Guess who just made an appearance in Detroit in 2016? Baphomet, lover of Psyche, son of Apollyon, revered by the Freemasons, because in 1700 Baphomet or Pan actually spoke to one of the Freemason members. Pan was also seated at the gates of hell by the Rock of the Gods, where Jesus taught his disciples. This man keeps popping up everywhere. Jesus said, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome. Matthew 16. Jesus presented a clear challenge with his words at the rock of the gods at Caesarea Philippi. He didn't want his followers hiding from evil. He wanted them to storm the gates of hell. And I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew 16, 17.
Psychology is founded on a lie and a fabrication that draws mankind away from the truth about God, the spiritual, and true healing. Psyche is in fact herself a victim, like Eve was a victim. Pan appears again in 2016 at the opening of the tunnel through the Swiss Alps whose entry is now called the Gates of Hell. That's the EU definition. Here's a celebration with Angela Merkel, who runs the EU. Revelation 9-11, they have as a king over them, the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but the Greek he is known as Apollo. When they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them, and he will kill them. Here once again is Merkel at the Gates of Hell ceremony in Switzerland, taking the first ride on the train through the Gates of Hell. Isn't that apropos? So let's jump now to Carl Jung, a pioneer in the field of psychology and psychotherapy who developed his techniques directly from the occult. He developed archetypes, for example. The Apollo archetype values order and harmony and favors thinking over feeling, just the opposite of psyche. And here's a famous painting where Diana is waking Apollo. Jesus defined Apollo as the leader of the demonic realm who will arrive in the final days to plague mankind. And Jesus even defined how Apollo will really appear. Not so handsome. But back to Carl Jung. Jung developed the anima and the animus, a domain of the unconscious that transcends the personal psyche. In the unconscious of a man, this archetype finds expression as a feminine, inner personality called the anima. Equivalently, in the unconscious of woman, it's expressed as a masculine interpersonality called the animus. The Occult Roots of Psychology Jungians warn that every personification of the unconscious, the shadow, the anima, the animus, and the self have both a light and a dark aspect. They can bring life-giving development and creativeness to the personality, or they can cause petrification and physical death. How true that is. These are illustrations, by the way, from Carl Jung's Red Book. It's very interesting what uh, Carl Jung came up with in his drawings, revealing his own unconscious mind and what drove Carl Jung. Here, for example, is the serpent devouring the tree of knowledge. Here's another drawing of the Kundalini Serpents. We cover them in another video. Notice a common theme in these illustrations. They all have serpents or dragons associated with them. The dragon theme, we'll find out where that comes from in a second. That's because they are based on the Asian Chinese occult. The Chinese dragon gods. We don't know a whole lot about them, do we? We'll discover their source right after this. Here's another drawing by Carl Jung. The goat man or the beast. Here's another one where the dragon is taking a woman with a sword to the phallus. Hmm. All right, let's look into I Ching. Carl Jung was big on this. The roots of modern psychology, 1000 BC to 200 BC. The I Ching is a type of divination called clearmancy, 
produces random numbers between six and nine. You turn them into a hexagram, and then you look them up in an I Ching book, and you tell the future. It's like an old Ouija board, folks. In its ancient usage, a consultation with the I Ching involved the tossing of handfuls of sticks or coins. An I Chi consultation is divination. Let's go forth into the world for the benefit of those who can discern its meaning, preached Carl Jung, founder of psychology. And notice in each of these illustrations, there's a dragon. How the I Ching saved my life. Meet Carl Jung's favorite oracle to access your own inner wisdom. Ah, the tree of knowledge. I Ching, a synthesis of the I Ching and positive psychology. I Ching and transpersonal psychology. The tree of knowledge versus the tree of life. If something spiritual or supernatural happens to you, or you hear a voice or witness something that doesn't fit the mainstream, chances are someone's going to direct you to a psychologist. Because science cannot tolerate what it can't weigh or measure, unless it has to do with the evolution or the Big Bang creation or the transgender movement. And then you don't need science. Humanism has its roots in Greek philosophy. Exactly where the worship and the study or knowledge of psyche came from, or psychology. It's one of the major satanic forces at work in the world today and will ultimately open the way to the rise of the Antichrist. This ends part 2A, Psychology's Occult Roots. Watch for part 2B where we're going to look into the dynamics of occult-based group psychology or mob psychology which is now controlling our media. Part 3 then we introduce what are demons, your authority over demons, and depression and how it's spiritually related. Thank you all for watching. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you.